Hey everybody, good morning. Uh, actually, good afternoon out there on the East Coast. Uh, I'm JD Hoovener and welcome to the Bold Today Show. This is a live Q&A. We're talking patents, trademarks, startup, business law, uh, a lot. It's kind of a potpourri today for our last show of the year. I'm excited to have uh, our my co-host, of course, Matt Colseth, join us shortly, and a special guest, uh, Stacia Hoffman with Corner Point Law coming on soon. So uh, buckle up, it's gonna be a fast ride. Uh, we're gonna try to do that quick uh, deep dive. Yeah, quick deep dive, if you can do that, into business law, startups, um, and we're going to be fielding questions. Uh, I love live questions, so if you've got something on your mind, if you're an inventor, entrepreneur, business owner, maybe you're just curious about what this area of law is all about, that's what we want to talk about, okay? Uh, quick disclaimer, do not feel uh, the need to share your invention here, right? This is not a confidential forum, but if you do want to follow up, uh, we will be providing contact details to get in touch with us uh, during the pod podcast, during the broadcast as well. So there's that legal notice, do not share specific invention information. Uh, by joining this, you know, we're not your attorneys, but we're gonna be sharing general advice, um, some tips, legal, you know, the law, and uh, helping you on your way on your journey. Um, so again, this is a live broadcast, we're live on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And so we're welcoming anybody that has questions, we'll take your questions first. Um, thank you also for those that have submitted questions on avvo.com. I've got about eight questions there. We're going to try to get to some of those if we have time, all right? So um, you can feel free to fast forward this if you're watching the broadcast afterward. Otherwise, stay with us. Hang in there. That might be a fun fun opportunity. All right, so I'm J.D. Hoovener, the owner here at Bold Patents Law Firm, and we'll be doing this broadcast here until 9.30 uh, on the West Coast here and then 12.30 on the East Coast. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on um, Stacia and Matt. Here's the gang. Hey guys, how are you doing? Hey JD, I'm good. Nice to uh, nice to see you and nice to see you, Stacia. Um, oh, you know, Hello. Ola from Mexico. I'm on vacation, so this is a perfect opportunity to take a break from the kids and and uh, catch up with you. Awesome, Matt. Thank you for for joining. And Stacia, are we saying your name right? I want to make sure we get that on on air. Correct. Is that about right? Close enough. Maybe a little bit of a lag too on the on the timing. This is uh, maybe internet a little slow, or maybe ours is a little slow. Hard to tell. Uh, but I know she is able to. Uh, we were checking beforehand, but hopefully she can get get in uh, and say hi. Uh, she's with Corner Point Law, and it is a uh, it's a business law firm, and it's based in Seattle. Um, and so what uh, I'm hoping we can do today is uh, field questions on startup law and kind of go through some of the basics. Um, she sent me a few questions that I think are questions that all of our clients at Bold ask. Um, and so what I want to do is go through some of those questions and hopefully Stacia can hear us. I know it's um, sometimes tricky, you know, having her on for the first time. So if we can't connect in, we'll have her back um, and with those questions. So maybe just to tee up, if you're able to hear me, um, why, you know, when you form a company, right, and you know, a lot of inventors want to do that because maybe they hear that, you know, on Shark Tank or some of these shows that you, people watch um, or just, you know, lessons learned from their grandpa or from their dad or mother or grandma, that you should form a company. Okay. And so a lot of our inventor clients do that, sometimes on their own, sometimes they hire counsel very wisely. But, you know, this next step of having an operating agreement, you know, why, why would you need to form an agreement? Even if you're on your own, solo. And so, Stacia, if you can hear me, maybe you could jump in on that question. I'd love to hear your input. You know, why would someone want to do that? All right. Matt, I know you've got a lot of experience. Do you want to take this on? Yeah. Um, Stacia, can you hear me? I think for some reason she's not able to hear you, JD. Stacia, can you hear me at all? I can hear you just fine, Matt. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Go ahead. This is really weird. Okay, good. Yeah, no, this is, this is kind of strange, but um, Stacia, I'll just, I'll, I'll re kind of pitch you the, uh, the the quick question. So JD was, Perfect, you know, um, yeah, JD was, was curious basically from, from some of the audience members about, you know, starting up a new business and they might have heard why it's important to have a, a company, right? You should, you should have a company. Can you give us a couple or a few reasons why having an LLC or a corporation is so important to the, the new entrepreneur? Absolutely. So one of the main reasons that people choose to have a 
corporation or LLC is this idea of protection from liability. Um, and what the law actually provides us is the creation of a new person, which is sort of strange to think about. But really, it, you know, we hear a lot of complaints about the idea that corporations and LLCs are people, but under the law, they're obviously not human beings, but they are treated as people. So there are a lot of protections that can be afforded um, from liability when you have a shell of a corporation or an LLC to protect um, business transactions. In certain instances, it can be protection from tort liability um, because you're transferring in many, many instances liability from the individuals involved to a corporation. Oh, Stacey, you still there? I am. Okay, sorry. Perfect. Matt, do you want to jump in on the operating agreement question? Take that one next step. So I can talk a little bit more about the liability aspect because there are some things that people are sometimes surprised to learn. And one of those things is that even though, you know, if, if your business is to go, um, let's say, enter into a relationship with another business and you have a contract and business A is going into business with your business, those can be the parties to the contract. So that provides a lot of protection. But what the law also says is that individuals are always liable for their own torts and their own actions. So sometimes people are you know, surprised to learn that, oh, if I form an LLC or a corporation, and if I, the individual owner, do something wrong, shouldn't I be protected from everything? And that's just not the case. It provides great protection but it doesn't always provide protection in those instances where um, the actor, so to speak, is perhaps the owner and perhaps the owner engages in some sort of activity. Sometimes it can be intentional or you know, worst case scenario, some sort of fraudulence, but best case scenario, it can even be something um, on the level of mere negligence. Then if, if the owner is the actor, they still can face personal liability. So it's not a blanket protection. It's not um, foolproof, but it really does provide a lot of a lot of um, a lot of security. Awesome, that's great. Um, Stacey, if you can hear me, or Kaylee, if you can, but maybe Matt, you can hear me. Um, yeah. You know, I know, I think people have uh, appreciation for you know forming a company. You know, and I, one of the pieces of advice I always hear from people like yourself, business attorneys, is to get a contract in place, uh, an operating agreement or a shareholders agreement for a corporation. So what, uh, what would you say to someone who's saying, oh, I don't need one of those, you know, or, or what are the main benefits of having it? I'll, I'll um, Stacia, so <laughs> this is really kind of straight. I don't know what's going on. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, it's a telephone, right? And, and uh, we'll see how you know garbled it, it gets through me. But JD's curious, you know, for for the client who's like, you know, I don't really need, it. I don't really need an operating agreement to LLC. I don't need a corporation. Um, can you speak to like how you would approach that particular client about you know why it's important? I mean, obviously you talked about liability, right? You know, personally, I know that there's tax benefits to having you know an LLC or corporation. And, and then, you know, I guess from my personal experience as well, you know, having that LLC or corporation is more enticing when you bring on partners, right? I mean, it's easier to bring new people into the fold if you, you know, are, you know, have a legal entity formed. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that comes up is that a lot of times um, if you're a solo, then there are a lot of benefits of having an LLC and a corporation, but there are also a lot of sole proprietors, um, myself included. Um, and so it, there, there are, which always is kind of funny to people, but I have a virtual office and I've assessed my liability and decided that for my own personal purposes, a sole proprietorship works really well. But if I had any partners, there's not a chance that I would... Um, not incorporate and so the beautiful thing about having an llc or a corporation with others is that it makes the operation so much easier so you have that bell of liability on the first hand which usually happens with bigger businesses or even you know medium-sized businesses but the second thing is you can 
utilize contracts to spell out all the duties of all the parties. And so whether it's a corporation or an LLC, there are corporate documents that are put together in most circumstances that say, okay, this is how we're going to divvy up, you know, profits. This is how we're going to base possible conclusion of the business. Um, this is who's going to manage the business. This is going to, who's run the, going to run the day-to-day -day operations. So having that in writing is also kind of what I always think of. Um, you know, would you rent a space, um, rent a, rent an apartment, or would you buy a house with a, without a contract? I, I don't think most people would. And so would you go into business with others, particularly without having some binding legally enforceable agreement so that everyone is, you know, there are obligations owed, but that there are also responsibilities that flow back to you. And so it really can provide a lot of great protection. So I would not recommend that anyone start a business with partners without having some sort of corporate formation as, and that can include an LLC. I mostly work with LLCs and it can also include, um, uh, and it should include in that instance, an operating agreement or, you know, articles of incorporation and bylaws. So what the, the sometimes difficult thing is for these really small businesses who we have a lot of really creative people who are, you know, solos, so to speak. And lots of times they say, well, it's just me. So do I really need an operating agreement, you know, with myself. And it's a really good idea to have. Um, sometimes institutions like banks will ask for it. Um, it's good to be thinking about, I'm a big fan of preparing. So it's good to be thinking about what's going to happen if, you know, how am I going to manage this business? What's going to happen if I decide to stop doing business? Um, do I have to plan for transfer to any other family members? So there are a lot of things that can be beneficial even for you know, one member LLCs, single member LLCs. Yeah, that's that's really sage advice, Stacia. I, I like that idea. And you brought up another good point too, is, you know, having that business registered, I mean, that allows you basically to go get that federal employment identification number, get that business bank account, a um, whole bunch of, you know, tangier, you know, tangential benefits basically to having the registration. Now, now, what about like closely held family businesses? I mean, do you still need a operating agreement in that situation? That is an excellent question. So one of the things I wish I it was actually, mine. It was actually JD's. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, well, thanks. Um, actually, one of the things that I handle quite frequently are business breakups. And it's, it's one of those difficult things that a lot of times it is family members. And what we think about is we don't go into business with people we don't trust, right? I mean, you're going to go into business with people you trust. Maybe it's, maybe it is a family member. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a former colleague that you, you know, work 10 years together and trust that person implicitly. I mean, really that's all the more reason to have an agreement is because sometimes I think we let our guards down when we trust people and, 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 not realizing that sometimes the stresses of business or the um, you know, different visions, we all have different visions, we all have different approaches. And so sometimes, even though things may be, you know, you may be so close with your partners on a personal level, sometimes in a, um, in a, in a business level, it doesn't always work out as planned and people have different ideas. So that's all the more reason to have an agreement. Perfect. And that, and that tracks with the experience I've had with clients, too, just from a trademark registration perspective and working with these closely held family businesses. Um, it's mm -hmm. definitely advantageous for everyone to have that, that uh, you know, business actually formed as an LLC or a corporation. Um, well, thank you, Stacia. That's great. Do you Can you stick around for another 15 minutes and we can answer some sure. questions from all? Perfect. Absolutely. I'll be here. OK, great. So I'm going to flip it back over to JD and JD is going to um, basically talk a little bit about some questions that we've got from some of the, the viewers out there right now. And then yeah, I'll Great. pitch them back to you. <laughs> awesome. And Matt, actually, you can still hear me? Yeah, actually, you know what, Stacia? I think JD is going to put them on the, on the screen so yeah. you can just okay. read them and answer them if you don't mind. Perfect. So it's a registered agent question about a nonprofit in Florida. A lot yeah, of I'm reading the here. question okay. right now. So give me just a second. Of course. 
Stacia was not prepped with this question, by the way. So we'll let her just jump in. So that is an excellent question. So let me start off by saying that I am not licensed in the state of Florida. Um, so I cannot speak specifically to Florida law. Um, but let me talk general. The question was essentially, I am a registered agent and I've gotten word about something. And so what, what should I do? So speaking to that sort of question, if it were in Washington, um, your obligations as the registered agent, I'm going to assume for purposes of the question that, you, that the person asking the question is not um, any, has no other role within the organization, isn't a board member or anything like that, because the duties then may differ. There may be fiduciary duties owed to the corporation. In that instance, the, the question was specifically about a nonprofit corporation, but let's just assume only a registered agent. So in that instance in Washington, what the law, what the responsibility would be, would be to pass along any sort of information, specifically any sort of documentation that was received to the contact person that, you know, to the con, I mean, the ideal situation would be to the entire board. If you don't have a good contact person, if you're not sure who to contact to cover all bases, but presumably when the registered agent was chosen, there was some sort of communication about who should receive notice of, of any allegations or lawsuits. So the first thing that I would do is if I didn't have any sort of clear, um, any sort of clear idea of exactly who I should contact would be to contact the entire board, put it in writing, send any documentation. And if they don't respond to that, as long as that information has been passed on, um, that's the registered agent's primary duties. Perfect. Thank you for answering that question. Uh, JD's coming back on here, and I think he's got another question he's going to put up for us. Yep, sure do. And this is a Washington law specific. Sorry for giving you that Florida question. That's okay. Um, this is about an, <laughs> oh, you can hear me now. Thank goodness. Okay, that works. I okay, can. Good. That is wow. so weird. Okay, we're live in color. Okay, so this is uh, this is a, a complex one. This is out of Spokane, Washington. Again, I don't know, Stacia has not been prepped with these questions. This is just some fun. I'm um, hoping she can jump in. So should I purchase an existing S corp? Okay, a lot going on. If you're looking at someone's looking at buying an existing family business. So we've already hit family today. Um, I was told mm -hmm. by the IRS that in order to have it put on my name, all I have to do is submit this form. Um, is that right? You know, you know, and that's what you have to you know jump on that. But then talking about just purchasing, right? Having an LLC, buying it, and DBA. So um, the question does go on, but it's probably a lot to chew on. So I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, so I'm just reading through the question. And I also, again, want to say, even though I am licensed in Washington, this is not legal advice. We have to always make that sort of clear um, because I don't have yep. all the information. But my general recommendation um, is for anyone who's purchasing a business, whether it's an S Corp, whether it's an LLC um, or an LLC tax is an S Corp, you know what you could go through the motions and the process of changing all the registrations, right? So with the IRS, with if there are employees, you're going to also have to handle the ESD and, and you know Employment Security Department in Washington, as well as L and I. Um, the business license information is going to have to be updated. Department of Revenue is going to have to be updated. So that there are other registrations that absolutely would need to take effect, other than with the federal government, um, that would need to be changed. But it is my personal opinion that with the transfer of a business, even if the business is continuing on in its current form, um, to have a purchase and sell agreement so that there's a clear line of what the party's obligations are and are not. Specifically, let me just touch on one thing real quickly that might be a good reason to, to have a purchase and sell agreement is liabilities. So, you know, this previous owner of the business may or may not have liabilities. They may or may not have debt. They may or may not have these obligations that they owe to other people. And so if all you do is step in, then there is a very decent chance that there any liabilities would flow, you know, without question. Um, and I would wonder if there was the opportunity to, to really do due diligence. So the parties can choose, hey, any you know, pre-sell any liabilities, here's who's going to handle them and here's what's going to happen to them and who's going to be responsible for them if they exist and the parties don't realize that they exist. So yeah. kind of that allocation of risk is really helpful um, with the purchase and sell agreement. Right. So that's right. what I would Okay, recommend. cool. That's good. I love it. So even if you're, you know, even if it's everybody that you know, met before or 
you, you know, you both, you, you know, the owner of the company you're buying again, a good reason to, to get something documented. Um, mm -hmm. Cool. Awesome. Good stuff. Well, we'll give you a little bit of a break. You've been in the hot seat for a while. Um, I want to jump to a couple of trademark questions and patent questions, and I feel like you could probably jump in. Um, so I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to get, put Matt on the ball here with this question. Okay. This one's out of Dallas, Texas. This is in depth. This is getting into the classifications here, Matt. You're going to, uh, you know, yeah, scoot up and listen in. Um, this would be a good one. So we're talking skincare. I'll let you, I'll let you read up on this question. I like to read it off. So if I, if I add words to a trademark or change the design, will my trademark pass? I want to name my skincare company Good Skin Self Care. So they got the category there. They're, they're wondering, um, you know, if they disclaim the word Skin MD, will it pass? Will it, will it be enough? Great question. Um, so yeah. So here, here's my take on it. Obviously, this is not legal advice. Um, but what what I would say is that you know, obviously, we're talking about. Class three, that's beauty cosmetics, skincare falls into that hair, et cetera. Um, when you have two trademarks that are this close together, right, that you know, good skin is the main focus of the trademark registration or application, anything you do around that, especially like a colon, semicolon, you know, something else, I mean, the USPTO is going to view that as basically a derivative trademark, right? So that feels to me as a potential consumer that this is just another product line of the existing company or brand at the USPTO. And that's how the USPTO is going to view it, is that this feels like um, a likelihood of confusion, that a potential consumer is going to see that product or that application um, and they basically make the assumption that this is just a derivative secondary product of good skin MD or, or whatever the existing brand is at the, at the USPTO. So, you know, my just quick take on that is that's going to be a potential issue from registration and infringement perspective. So call me. We'll, we'll talk about some other ideas. Oh, JD, I think you're on mute here. Thank you. I was just rambling like crazy. Okay, here we go. Matt, that was awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I was my hunch as well when I saw that. Like, that's pretty close, you know. But, um, hey, you know, it's... Uh, Sometimes worth a shot, and it's always worth getting a legal opinion if you're not sure on you know, something that's too close. You've done some research, uh, there may be some wiggle room, right? Um, so let me uh, let me put our contact information. If you, after hearing the show today, uh, hearing Stacia, Matt, and myself speak a little bit, and you want to see if um, now's the time to move forward with either protecting your trademark or your invention, uh, there's a link right there. So that's a special link for the weekly live. You're going to want to use that uh, to schedule a free screening session, and that's it is what it is. We're screening you. You're interviewing us, right? And we're trying to see if it's a, a good fit uh, for both parties to see if we're um, a good law firm for you. Uh, so that's the link to use. Uh, let's jump to our, what might be our second to last question. I wanna do one more on trademarks. Um, and this is out of Maine. I don't see the state of Maine come up very often, but Ellsworth, Maine, M-E, M -E, that's Maine, right? Okay, hopefully. Um, so this is about, the business name, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to go in, in multiple parts here so we're not reading. It's not blocking all of our faces. So can someone sue me over rights to my business name? I created a business name three years ago and hired a firm to design a logo for me. Now the logo design firm wants to give the name to another customer. Oh, my goodness. At least that's what they say. They're threatening if I don't hire them to register the mark, their new client will sue me. Holy smokes. They mentioned a cease and desist letter will be on the way. This is like seems like total BS. Can they do this? Let's keep it hypothetical, Matt. But yeah, yeah we'll that's uh, aggressive. Yeah, no, this um wow, yeah, that is that is, that is a hot mess of a situation. Uh, I think that's the technical term for it. So I, I've dealt with this situation numerous times with, with clients and branding. Um, they have a friend or another business that does a logo design for them. And ultimately, um, the designer comes back and says, hey, you know, I want a piece of the action because I designed the logo. I charged you less than I should have. And I have rights to the, the copyright, essentially, in your logo. Um, so it's both a copyright issue and a trademark issue. When you work with um, a designer for your logo, if you're working with anyone who is somewhat sophisticated, you know, a professional in that field, 
they are going to um, have you sign a contract. Um, and in that contract, it will specifically say that this is a work made for hire agreement. So they are assigning all copyright or intellectual property rights in the actual artistic creation to you as the purchaser of that design. Um, and, and then basically you own that copyright to your logo that you will use as a trademark, you know, lock, stock and barrel. Um, so that is how we avoid issues like this uh, in the first place. Um, in terms of um, how you would potentially settle something like this, I mean, I would need to take a look at the, the facts of the case, get in touch with the other, the other party and, and really understand, is there um, a work made for hire agreement in place? Was there an implied work for made for hire agreement in place? Um, sometimes we can infer that there is, but, um, yeah, that's a complicated question. And it seems like you would need to contact an attorney to kind of work through that situation, have a better understanding of, um, the best way forward. Yeah, totally yeah. agree. I'm going to put your contact information here, Matt, in case anybody does want to get a hold of you via email, that's his direct email. Um, yeah, I love how you touched on copyright and trademarks there. Uh, people do get confused with respect to design groups. Sounds like this was just a designer way overstepping their bounds. Um, but like you said, it maybe I don't know if you said exactly, but I think one thing that came to my mind was, have they been maintaining that mark for three years? Or did they at some point abandon use of that design mark as part of you know being that indication that that's the source of their goods or services? Potentially then if they've abandoned, if you've stopped using that mark, maybe it's true that someone else could pick that up and use Great it, point. right? Great point, yep. Typically the USPTO um, considers three years of you know disuse, uh, abandonment. Got it, that's cool. Okay, let's do one question. I gotta get one patent question and I'm gonna try to sneak it in. This one's not easy, um, but uh, it's about ownership and it's really important Inventors worry about this a lot. We're going to cover up the whole screen. Sorry. So whom can I sue for patent infringement or wrong uh, due to patent ownership? Do I try to sue the company CEO or the trade office? Uh, my name is, oh my goodness, I put the name in there. I was a, Timothy Bunch. I was awarded a mobile security monitoring system, with patent number uh, right there, ending 563 in 2012. My renewal fees were paid and current uh, during the possible infringement concern. I reside in the state of Georgia, which doesn't have patent attorneys to consult with. I do believe that's not true, as I'm sure there are attorneys, in, patent attorneys in Georgia. I have I have seen Owl Security Company on television, and they are selling a product very similar. Let's get the rest of the question in here. So this is the alleged infringing group, Owl Security, on television selling a similar product to mine. Okay. And as I was reading this, I'm curious, I want to pull that patent number up. And we're down like two minutes left, but eight, two, seven, four, five, six, three. Let's just do it. Let's do it. And I'll show that everybody how to go on to Google Patents ultra quick. Google Patents is a wonderful resource. I've got it pinned on my bar. Eight, two, seven, four, five, six, three. Mobile shirt, yep, indeed. Let's check and see. What's this guy, Tim, telling us the truth? And it's loading. Things always hey, load. Loader. Yes, sir. Hey, JD, can you, um, can you pull down the, uh, the question so we can see your screen a little better? If you wouldn't mind? Oh, it's stuck on there. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I'm going to plug that out. Perfect. Okay. So here we go. And the cover sheet says a lot. Okay, so this was issued September 25, 2012. Timothy Bunch, indeed, out of Hethsaban, Georgia. There it is. What I was thinking there might be on this is that there might be an a assignee, an owner, apart from the inventor, but there is not a separate assignee. Timothy Bunch does indeed own this, free and clear on his own. And if what he's saying is true, that he has paid all of his maintenance fees. Okay, maintenance fees are those fees you have to pay after the patent is granted. You don't just get that full 20 years of, of life without paying the patent office, okay? There is that definitely fees due around the three, seven year and 11 year mark. So assuming those fees have been upheld and he believes there'd be infringement happening, by all means, you can and should hire a patent attorney uh, to pursue those, those allegations. Um, now, not all patent attorneys and certainly our firm uh, don't handle litigation. So it's something to, and let me stop sharing here if I can figure out where that is. Um, whoops. Stop sharing here. 
Okay. Oh yeah. I'll remove it. Okay. So not all patent firms will do litigation, right? Bold patents, we do just the prosecution side, right? We, we focus on just getting you the best patent. There are a lot of firms that help you with fighting fights, right? Seeking settlement, getting, getting, driving toward, uh, you know, damage settlement and that type of thing. Um, one good thing about patent law, which is awesome for you, is it's not state specific. You can hire a patent attorney anywhere in the country outside of Georgia. Um, and they can, they can help you, right? And evaluate. And one of the cool things that our firm does is we help you with an infringement opinion. So before you go spend the big bucks and hire a litigator, do some homework first, hire an attorney to say, is this firm, Owl Security, actually infringing the claims that you own? So uh, congrats on getting that patent and uh, follow that link above to schedule a free screening session to get started. So cool. We're over at one minute, but thank you, Matt. Thank you, Stacia, for being on. Stacia, Absolutely. it was really a pleasure to have you as part of our group. Sorry for the audio issues earlier. We'll have to have you back and we'll have to, you know, test that ahead of time. Sorry for that. Well, so, happy holidays, Stacia. everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Absolutely. I did include your contact information um, for people to reach out to your website. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll have, uh, we'll have a good time. And yeah, happy holidays to all of you uh, viewers out there, to you, Matt. Enjoy the rest of your vacation. We'll be uh, Thanks. we'll be your next year. Our first show is going to be the Wednesday the fifth. So we'll see you all then. Take care and have a good day. Go big, go bold.